Hello, shalom, and good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you all here today. Today, I'm going to be um, introducing, and we're going to hear from some of our amazing clinical staff here at the NYU Dysautonomia Center who dedicate their lives and our research and um, it went in doing clinical care for patients and families living with FD. And this is Zenith Khan, and my name is <laughs> Taya Dalamo. First, you'll be hearing from our director, Dr. Kaufman, and then you'll be hearing from the co-director, Dr. Alejandra Gonzalez Duarte, then also Dr. Patricio Millar, ophthalmologist, Dr. Leela Raju, nurse practitioner, Zenith Khan, and then finally, the social worker student, Matthew Hertzberg. And here is Dr. Kaufman, who will be talking about our FD community. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending which part of the world you're in. Thank you so much for tuning in. And as you heard, welcome to FD Day 2023. That is the 38th annual meeting and is my personal 17th uh, FD Day. As you, as you, many of you remember, because you have been there, it is since 1985, on the second Sunday of June, that the FD community meets to celebrate another year and find out about the latest medical news. As, as many of you remember, FD used to be in New York at NYU in person, face to face. But this, as you heard from Lainey, is the fourth year that FD Day occurs online. Well, we thought that the benefits of watching from home were big enough for so many families that we kept this annual event online. Of course, we, the staff at the, at the center, and, and we assume many patients and families, uh, nevertheless, they still miss the warmth of seeing each other in person and uh, the, the dinner with patients that um, we had before, and you know, many of us miss that. So perhaps in the future, and it depends on your input, we will organize some type of hybrid event, something will combine the face-to-face -face with online event. As you saw, uh, we went full Hollywood this year, and we have two MCs, Kaya and, and Zenith, our, our star, star uh, NPs. So, as, as every year, I would briefly uh, start with the statistics and review some, some of these numbers for you. Well, there are three new FD patients in, in our database. There's a boy and a girl in Israel and a girl in Australia uh, who's 10 months old. And you saw in the video, this, uh, you saw her mother and this uh, very sweet girl, she's our, uh, one of our new patients. Altogether, uh, there are 301 uh, people with FD around the world that we are in direct contact with. Now, the youngest person with FD is less than a year old, is the one, uh, is this sweet girl I just mentioned, she's 10 months old. And the oldest patient with FD is 66 years old, and she lives in the US. 101 people are younger than 25 year old, and 200 are older than 25. And if you if you look here at the at the sex distribution, there is slightly more females than men, just small amount. Now. <clears throat> Where are the around the world, the patients with FD? Well, it's truly, as you would expect, a, an international community. They are distributed, people are distributed in 14 countries. Um, in Israel, the US, the United Kingdom, Canada, Argentina, Australia, Germany, Mexico, Brazil, Austria, Turkey, Belgium and France, you know, quite quite a distribution. Now, this has been a very active year at the at the FD Center, both in in clinical activities and also in a number of studies. 
we we continue to see many of you via uh, telehealth but also many patients are now again traveling to the center and of course we are always happy to see you now some of the main clinical and, and study activities that go on, this, go on at the center are described in the yearly booklet. I, I'm showing you in the slide the, 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 the cover of the 22-23 um, booklet. As you see this, or as, as um, Lenny which will show you, the booklet is available online for anybody to, to download. And you will also receive um, a, a hard copy on the, on the mail or, or through email. So I, I will not go, we have just little time, so I will not go over all the activities. I just want to briefly update you on um, some of the new treatments and you'll have the opportunity to hear more, not only in the research or read more in the research booklet, but also ask the investigators during the Q&A. So let me remind you uh, something I do every year, that there are two types of treatments. There is the symptomatic treatment, that is the one that targets symptoms, things that you feel, and the idea is to make you feel better right away. The other type of treatments are the disease-modifying treatments that do not target the symptom, but actually the cause. And the goal of this treatment is to prevent or reverse, when possible, the progression of the disease, and this may not make you feel immediately better. So we are working on both types of treatments at the uh, center. One we had focus on because it's one of the biggest problems and, um, um, and, and, and is a real unmet need. We still cannot treat the crisis in, the, in, 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 in a perfect way. Particularly, we cannot treat them at home or, or it's difficult to treat them effectively at home. So as you know, many autonomic crises happen without apparent cause meaning they are not triggered by infections or other medical stressors. And as you know yourself, they remain a very disabling problem for people with FD. So a new clinical trial that should start this month after um, a long preparation and, and administrative and, and legal issues, we're going to start the new trial uh, using Presedex or dexmedetomely. Uh, as you know, Presidec has been a game changer, as many of you have experienced personally. It relieves the symptoms of autonomic crisis very quickly. Now, the main limitation is that you need to be in the hospital. So, because um, dexmetomidine or Presidex requires IV administration. So, um, we, we think, we can still think that we can change that that is possible to try this medication at home. Therefore, uh, the trial will, um, will be using a new formulation of sublingual dexmetomidine at home. So if you experience an autonomic crisis, you will make a video call to the center and one clinician will guide you from there. While we are monitoring and, and seeing your symptoms, we will measure your blood pressure, your heart rate, and the severity of the crisis. And according to that, we will make a decision whether to take the sublingual film. And then to assess the effectiveness of the treatment, we will be using a new scale, not just blood pressure and heart rate, but we are uh, trying this new scale that will measure the severity of symptoms. And again, we hope to start this trial within uh, the next 30 days. Let me briefly tell you about disease-modifying treatments. These continue to, to, uh, to being developed. And as you all know, ELP1 um, is, a, is a protein that is reducing FD. The reduction of this protein is due to a, a gene mutation, the one that was discovered by, by Suze Lagerhout, and is, the, is where the, the blueprint of this protein is located. There is an, an abnormality there. 
So this abnormality, this mutation results in low levels of a normal LP1 protein. Now, the problem is that when this protein is in, in low levels, during the development, during embryogenesis, when the fetus is, is, is being developed, there are some neurons that never develop properly. Now, in addition to that, during life, this low protein also affects the survival of some of these neurons. So our goal by correcting the genetic defect is to increase the level of this neuron, this protein, and prevent the progressive degeneration of neurons in the retina and in the, the ones that innervate the muscles that give you the sensation was called proprioception, proprioception, and we believe that we could prevent the um, abnormalities of this. So, this, why are we using these two measures? Well, because they are the ones that we can, we can assess effectively, and we expect with this genetic treatment to um, prevent the reduction of visual acuity and meaning the, the blindness that can develop and the abnormalities in balance. Now, the, what are the approaches? The approaches to fix the splicing defect or the mutation defect and produce more protein, there are effectively three, um, these I'm just using these slides to, to repeat what I told you, that the idea is that disease-modifying um, drugs will prevent the neuronal loss in the retina and the loss of proprioceptive neurons in the dorsal root ganglia. So there are three complementary approaches, and you will hear about these more. The simplest treatment to correct splicing is with a drug that can be taken by mouth, that's a small molecule, and is derived from kinetin, a compound that you heard a lot about, that was first reported by Suze Lagerhout to correct splicing in 2004, 18 years ago. Now, that molecule went through a lot of changes, and there is one that has now been selected we are completing the toxicology and other studies to try them in patients. Now, Sue and Elisabetta have secured funding for these from the NIH, and we are actively working to have this done. They will tell you more details. The second possibility or the second route that is also complementary is the use of what's called an antisense oligonucleotide. Now, antisense oligonucleotides are small molecules that bind to RNA or DNA and can um, correct the splicing defect. We are using one that was developed by Adrian Craner a few years ago. And then there is a foundation called the Enloren Foundation that has been working with us for the last two years to perform all the studies, including the toxicology, to uh, try this initially in one patient, and we hope in a few months that that will start. Um, one of the limitations, although uh, for an ASO, is that it requires intrathecal administration. We'll, we'll have to, to be given with a spinal tap. Uh, so, and as I tell you, this trial, we start with one young patient, and based on the results, we hope to be able to extend this treatment to others. Now, in addition to the, the third complementary um, strategy is to use um, the viral vectors with the normal gene or a part of that gene injected directly in the blood or uh, in the eye to correct this, the, the genetic defect. And Francis Lefkort, Zoo, Slagerhat, and Elisabetta are together working on, on, this, um, on this alternative, which is also quite interesting, and it still requires a lot of work but we hope in the future to, to be able to 
to, to do that. Again, you will hear more uh, about this. And we expect to impact both vision and inability or difficulty walking in patients with, with, with this. So let me finish here by uh, telling you again that a lot of details of what we are doing and what's going on at the center is written in the yearly booklet. Uh, you see the cover here. I hope you, you browse through it and um, uh, any questions you have, contact the center and we'll be happy to answer the questions in the to the best of our ability so thank you very much and i um, leave you now with dr gonzalez duarte thank you thank you so much dr kaufman for all of your care and your insight next we will have dr um, alejandra gonzalez duarte our co-director will be talking about clinical care in ft hey hi hello i i am very happy to be here and i hope that you can run the presentation Hello everybody and welcome to FD Day. My name is Alejandra Gonzalez Duarte. I want to persuade you that caring for FD is much a science as a precision skill. That having FD is not equivalent to giving the same treatment always, as many variables take place in each individual, and that there are no identical cases. Despite how similar FD may sound, each person has a unique condition and requires their own personal approach. Previously, medicine was seen as the ability to understand the body like a machine clock by separating its parts into individual pieces. Linearity brought a degree of predictability, meaning that a known input ought to produce a similar effect repeatedly, assuming a cause to effect pathway. If I have a risk factor A, I will have disease B and thus I should receive treatment C. This is a very simplistic view of the complexity of the human body and the notion of one gene, one disease was disregarded. As we all know that mutations such as the one found in FD affect multiple and apparently unrelated systems. Complexity science is a novel conceptualization of disease and interventions to prevent and treat diseases and promote health. These interventions are far from the simplistic concept of linearity and encompass lack of hierarchies, self-organization, and organ cross-talking. Adaptation allows the system to modify its structures through self-organization and cope with environmental forces or influences. For example, the rise in temperature will change the behavior of cold-blooded animals to reduce heat production. An example of adaptation in FD is the constant body sway of patients while standing to promote muscle constructions and pump blood to the brain as a response to their low blood pressure. Since these systems are not passive and adapt to the organization process, they are not always predictable and one action changes the context of other agents. As a result, the system may yield novel properties. In one word, each body will have its own rules. Self-organization. The human body has several organ systems and subsystems that are embedded. They interact with one another through a range of diverse pathways. Chemical interactions, for example, the production of dopamine resulting in retching and vomiting, diffusion of chemicals during the tissue planes, like the production of tears that nourish the eyes, neuronal connections, like in the increase in heart rate and blood pressure mediated by the baroreflex, immune pathways, hormones, cytokines, just to name a few. These systems uniquely interact with one another in each person, adapting to the changing context and giving rise to the emergence of new properties in the body of each patient. A feature of this relationship is nonlinear dynamics. A minor insult, for example, a gastric bleeding from a stress ulcer, can have catastrophic consequences for one patient and be disregarded by others. Lack of hierarchy. Each subsystem has a different way of communicating. The nervous system through the nerves, the endocrine system through the hormones, etc. The links between each system are relative and their importance changes with time. The hierarchical paths evolve constantly. For example, when there is a fear response, the heart, muscle, and nerves will overcome the kidneys producing urine. Not that the urine system closes completely, but is less critical du during danger. Organ cross-talking. 
Organ crosstalking can be defined as the complex and mutual biological communication between distant organs, mediated by signaling factors. This novel concept encompasses the close relationship between systems not noticed superficially, for example, the microbiome and the brain. This is especially true in FD, where we found that the gut flora differs in each patient and even between them and their relatives. In conclusion, Complexity sciences are aimed to demonstrate the human body systems that are convoluted and prone to chaos if modified in depth. A system may be susceptible to a particular condition, and a slight difference in this condition can lead to widely divergent outcomes, including catastrophic consequences under circumstances reminiscent of a perfect storm. Since several subsystems interact simultaneously in a combination unique to that human being, the manifestations are also unique, which accounts for the subtle difference in presentation with a similar disease process. Thus, one person may have autonomic features such as sweating, nausea, retching during an autonomic crisis, while other may have minimal autonomic features but will produce other changes in the body. Personalized therapy should consider this aspect and not be limited to identifying solely the patient's genetic constitution, which is one of the many variables determining therapeutic efficacy. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez Duarte. And next we'll be hearing from Dr. Patricio Malar on clinical care versus uh, clinical trials here at the Familial Dysautonomia Center. Hi, good morning. I'm I'm very excited to be here in FD Day and to see so many people joining from all over the world. So <clears throat> today I'm going to be talking about a question that we often get asked uh, during FD annuals, which is, uh, is this test part of my clinical care or is it part of a clinical study? And uh, really the answer is very simple. It's both because at every visit we make sure that we integrate every aspect of your clinical care and your history of an, as an FD patient into clinical studies. And at the same time, we try to make sure that absolutely everything that we study in FD has a direct clinical benefit for your care. So this way, by thoroughly documenting every aspect of your care and of your FD history, we're able to look back and find associations that help us identify problems and how to better address them and treat them. So, for example, and you're going to see this in the uh, FD booklet as much as uh, of the research that we have been doing here. We found earlier this year that people with FD are much more likely to have gastric bleedings than people without FD. And when we started looking at deeper into the causes of why this happens in FD, it seems that people who have more frequent or more severe autonomic crisis were more likely to have a gastric bleed at any time in their lives. So at the same time, more than 10 years ago, we started to have a better understanding of what happens during an autonomic crisis and what triggers an autonomic crisis. And part of that, we know that they're associated with an increase of noradrenaline, which is a hormone that is related with stress and blood pressure changes. So we know that this increase in noradrenaline is also associated with these high fluctuations in blood pressures that you very well know happen during autonomic crisis. So at the same time, when we looked at the kidney function of patients with FD, we found that these blood pressure fluctuations, these very high highs and lows, tend to worsen kidney function over time. For this reason, we started using Corvidopa, which is a medication that helps reduce the levels of noradrenaline. And we now know that Corvidopa works because when we look at these blood pressure monitors that, that you wear in your arms for a whole day, and we get the results back from the urine samples that you collect during 24 hours, we see that the carbidopa helps reduce the noradrenaline. Patients have less severe and less frequent crisis, and this helps stabilize the blood pressure. So overall, it is now a common knowledge that high noradrenaline causes autonomic crisis with high fluctuations in blood pressure that increase the risk of gastric bleeding and kidney problems. But we also know that using Corvidopa can help not only reduce the crisis, but hopefully also reduce the risk of gastric bleeding and kidney function in FD. And this knowledge 
is only possible thanks to the participation of over 300 patients with FD over the past 15 years, which makes FD truly a community that helps and cares for each other. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. That was really helpful. And I think it explained really a difference between clinical trials only and what we see with patients every day when they come in for mm -hmm. their FD annuals. So thank you so much to all the patients and parents also for all of your patients with um, everything we do. Next, we're going to be hearing from our skilled ophthalmologist, Dr. Leela Raju, who um, provides expert care to patients with FD and um, care for their eyes. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Alila Raju and I want to thank Dr. Kaufman and the team for inviting me to speak at FD Day. I hope that I'll give you some old and maybe new and interesting options for helping treat corneal disease in FD. I have no financial interest in any of the products that I will be presenting or talking about. So when we think of the surface of the eye, it's not just the tears that matter. It's the composition of the tears. It's how the eyelids work and how do they work to spread the tears across the surface. So if one of these components is not working, you will have different aspects of the dry eye affecting either the surface or how quickly scratches heal and it can lead to many different issues. Of course, the most important thing is prevention. If we can prevent scratches from forming in the first place, we're always in a better shape. So if we can recognize incomplete blink, which is pretty common, and also recognize when patients don't have pain, even though they have a scratch, that would suggest that the cornea is neurotrophic or essentially numb. And this can be tested in the office with a cotton tip or esthesiometer, which is an instrument that can measure the level of sensitivity of the cornea. But when we know that these corneas are not sensing dryness appropriately, sometimes we will suggest punctal plugs, which is a small plastic insert that will help block where the tears drain, which is in the lower lid near the nose. Or we can even cauterize the punctum if the punctal plugs have not been as effective or staying in place. And in patients that have had recurrent erosions or concerns of corneal surface healing, we always want to ask about herpetic infections, the cold sore virus, unfortunately really slows healing in many cases. And it's because a patient has FD does not mean that we don't have to think about how a cold sore virus might be affecting the healing. A big part of prevention is also making sure that the eye doesn't dry out overnight. And that can be done with moisture chamber or goggles, moisture chamber goggles that you see to the right there. And these can be purchased online and they just help retain a moist environment around the eye, even if the eye is a little bit open or maybe has something like CPAP blowing air into the eyes overnight, which will also dry them out. Another question I get asked a lot about for prevention is preservative-free or preserved artificial tear medications. And as long as they are only being used five times a day or less, a preserved artificial tear is fine. However, more than that, a preservative-free option is probably better and will be less likely to cause irritation from the preservatives themselves. Sometimes this prevention doesn't work and we have to treat abrasions that are not healing with amniotic membrane, which can be placed on the surface and promotes healing. Sometimes even a closure of the eyelids, even for a short period of time is necessary, either done by a stitch that is removed or a glue that helps close the lids or a piece of tape that is done periodically in order to make sure that the eyelids cover the area of the non-healing surface and it has time to be protected and heal on its own. Some newer modalities that are available to us now are lafitograst, also known as Zydra, and 0.09% cyclosporin, known as Sequa. These are similar to other medications that you may have heard of called Restasis, and they do promote decreased inflammation on the surface and can be a long-term adjunct to help prevent abrasions and worsening dry eye. There's also a nasal spray called Varenicline 
which has been shown to promote tear production and maybe a newer modality that can be used with other medications. In patients that have abrasions, I have been recommending trehalose containing artificial tears such as Theratears Extra or Ivisia, which are over the counter. These medications have been shown to help heal abrasion in my experience a little bit faster than the wide variety of other artificial tears that are available. In patients that have very constant dry eye and it's leading to repeated abrasions or very dry areas, I recommend serum tears. And in the US, a company called Vital Tears will come to your house, draw the blood and separate it out from the serum and the cells and dilute it appropriately so that they can be used as eye drops. And the picture you see to the right is actually a patient of mine who had a non-healing epithelial defect and uh, with a combination of serum tears from vital tears and a tarsorophy, this area did heal up. And a other, another newer modality called a center German, which is recombinant human nerve growth factor, has also been shown to work very well in patients with neurotrophic keratitis or the numb cornea. And it has shown to do quite well as compared to a control group uh, to help heal up persistent epithelial defects. Scleral lenses are also now a very common part of my treatment for severe dry eye because the contact does not sit on the surface but vaults over the cornea and this allows a liquid reservoir to always be between the cornea and the outside world and should hopefully prevent severe dry eye from causing recurrent scratches. There are many options and more cost-effective options as well than there used to be. However, it does require multiple fittings to make sure that it is comfortable and that the patient is able to take the contact lens in and out. So my take home points are that ocular surface protection is the most important, especially while sleeping. Uh, If a patient has CPAP and it's blowing air into the eyes, you want to make sure that there's no leak around any of the masks and also protect the eyes either with ointment or these moisture chambers that I discussed earlier. So this goes to show you that it's usually a combination of treatments that really keeps the eye protected and prevents uh, worsening issues. And we really wanna treat any scratches very early in FD because unfortunately they can become easily persistent and the cornea does not react well to not having an intact surface and it can lead to thinning of the cornea and even worse problems. So the faster we get the cornea surface healed up, the better off uh, the uh, patient feels and does. And it is something that we need to continually pay attention to. I want to thank the team again for the invitation to speak and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Raju, for all of your insight and all of your care for patients with FD. We really see how vision is a huge, has such a huge correlation between patients' quality of life, um, their ability to walk around, their um, independence. So we really, really try to focus hard on um, making sure that we're able to help them as much as we can. Absolutely. And while there are really severe problems in the eyes in FD, we know there are so many treatments that are really effective. So if you have any questions about this, please contact us after FD Day. And next, we'll have a special presentation from our very own nurse practitioner, Zenith Khan. Are you ready? Ready, ready. Okay. Hi, everyone. Many of you know me. My name is Dr. Zenith Khan. I'm a nurse practitioner here at the NYU Dysautonomia Center, where I've served this incredible population over the last four years. Through my time here, I've seen remarkable individuals who, despite living with FD and going through a worldwide pandemic, have shared how their jobs are a significant source of joy in their lives. Today, we'll be discussing education and career paths and advice of real people who are living with FD. As we know, people with FD have a wide range of physical and intellectual capabilities. We are inspired by many people with FD who have obtained education from universities, colleges, and technical schools. Many people with FD described having their job as fulfilling, rewarding, and helps them feel like everyone else their age. Their jobs allow them to serve in their communities and give back to their families. And jobs acts as a way to continue with socialization that often gets cut after K-12 through schooling is complete. We interviewed a sample of eight patients with FD, and they shared the following. 
37% of them completed a bachelor's degree, 37% completed some college or an associate's degree, and 25% of them did not go to college, however, did not feel like they needed college in order for them to be successful at their current places of employment. People with FD hold a diverse range of jobs, including being a cashier, a barista, a multimedia manager, a medical office receptionist, a veterinary receptionist, an artist, a business owner, a CEO, an IT support, um, and a disabilities activist. Majority of the participants mentioned that they received on-the-job training, which helped them be successful in their current roles. When asked what advice they would give to someone with FD who's looking to start working or transition into a new job, participants responded, never stop learning, stay up to date with technology. Uh, one person said to educate yourself about different adaptive devices and accessibility functions you can use. For example, he has some impaired vision, so he uses a screen reader or use a Siri. Another person said, don't let FD define you. Go into a job that you really like and do your best. I enjoy working because I feel like I'm treated like everyone else and everyone is beyond nice. Don't let your disease stop you from having a job. And one other person said, don't be afraid of starting a job. Do what you enjoy and try to find an agency to help someone with disabilities find a job if you're still looking. So what resources exist? Some participants mentioned that they use state-run services such as the Dis Disability Resource Coordinators through the Department of Labor Career Services, who can help with career counseling, resume development, career workshops, computer and internet access, and placement assistance. These coordinators can also provide counseling to job seekers who receive SSA benefits. So what should you consider if you're starting a job or embarking on a new career path? People with FD have a variety of skills and passions, as well as unique challenges and concerns, which can be associated with employment. Before starting a job, it's important for the person with FD and their families to consider some of these questions. What skills are useful for this job? What's the minimum and maximum education required? What are the physical and mental demands? What are the characteristics of work? And what resources exist that can help with funding and support? So how can the Dysautonomia Center help you in your future job? First, we can help optimize your health to perform certain jobs. We can provide letters of medical necessity for workplace accommodations, and we can help you get better faster and bounce back. Thank you very much for your time. I enjoyed seeing you all. Wow, that was really inspiring. Thank you so much, Zenith. I really learned a lot. I didn't know about the uh, the resources through the Department of the State Employment Services. Absolutely. I know a lot of parents and caregivers, they have questions. Well, you know, if my child starts working, um, will I be able to still qualify for SSA? Will I still be able to qualify for all the medical benefits that I receive? So these coordinators can really help go through exactly how many hours you can work a week um, and also help you find placement in terms of jobs that fit your capabilities and capacities. So amazing. And yeah. it was so inspiring hearing from people with FD saying, go after the job you like and do your best. Yeah, that was really that's very inspiring. <laughs> Inspiring. Perfect. Absolutely. So next we have our incredible social work intern, um, Matthew Hertzberg, who recently started a caregiver support group and will be sharing more information about caregivers and FD. Hi, I'm Matthew Hertzberg, the social work intern and MSW graduate student at the Dysautonomia Center. Over the last eight months, I've had the privilege of getting to know several FD patients and their families through weekly one-on-one -on -one therapeutic talk sessions and monthly virtual caregiver support groups. Nobody knows FD like our parent caregivers. Caring for a loved one can be a profoundly fulfilling experience, providing deeper relationships, self-efficacy, a sense of purpose, and pride. But the physical and emotional demands of time, energy, and responsibility take a great toll and can overshadow the positive aspects of caregiving. Prioritizing the health of their child, parents sacrifice sense of self and may be left feeling isolated, underappreciated, and yes, burnt out. The FD caregiver support groups offer a safe, judgment-free space for parents to share with each other the ups and downs their families encounter day to day. While it may be hard or impossible for those outside the FD community to fully appreciate these challenges, our encounters and group bring together parents from around the globe who get it. Just knowing there are others out there facing the same issues is a source of comfort. Parents tell me they look forward to these groups. 
if for nothing else than being part of a community. Often at the end of these meetings, parents express a sense of togetherness, of feeling less isolated, and gratitude. FD parents are so grateful to be offered this group. While my time at the center is short, it is my hope that the FD caregiver group will continue to grow and evolve to support, educate, and empower parents at all stages of their FD journey. If you haven't attended one of our virtual support groups, there's still time and all are welcome. To be added to the email list, please reach out to me directly or the Dysautonomia Center, and I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Wow, that was really nice hearing from you, Matthew. Thank you so much. Um, parents are really everything, and we learn so much from parents, and they're really just the, the rock and the foundation of care for FD. Absolutely. And Dr. Gonzalez Duarte always says, you know, ask the parents first. They are the experts. And, you know, it's um, so true. All of the information and the vital um, care that you guys give every single day, it's, it's truly inspiring.